we were halfway there. We were halfway there on this Thursday evening. We had just passed the Welcome to Oklahoma sign, coming closer and closer to the mecca known as Windstar Casino. <laughs> the highway was bumpy. The dash was flashing before me, 77, 77, to show that I was two miles over the speed limit. Mile by mile passed, and I watched the kutsu as it was woven into the trees as if a seamstress had come and took intentional time to make a tapestry. Finally, the road moved from bumps to smooth and the tires and the asphalt making their own type of music that moved into this mirage of background noises, the dogs panting, the podcaster speaking about how new books, children books, have become more politicized by politicians. And one of those books, not new at all, if you give a mouse a cookie, if you give a mouse a cookie, they'll want a glass of milk. If you give them a glass of milk, they want a straw. And if you give them a straw, they'll want another cookie. My mind continued to play the story in my head over and over. And this time I became so wrapped up by the podcaster's voice that the dash was flashing 86, 86, 11 <laughs> miles over the speed limit. And right as the road turned from bumpy again, I saw to the left of me on the interstate a sign that's in all capital letters, Jesus Christ, either he is or he ain't. The cracked is fell, and I believe it was supposed to say, Jesus is Christ, either he is or he ain't. I looked down at my navigation, it displayed 97 miles before I got to my destination, not my speed limit that time. <laughs> the thing is, there is no doubt that Jesus is Christ, but for some reason being in that place, in that space, in that state, for the next hour and 32 minutes, all I could think about was not if I believed it, but but it had to be true. But all the signs around me were about repentance and hot and cold and where you're going for eternity. My Jesus and their Jesus had to be totally different types of Jesus, whoever they are. And yes, Jesus is Christ. My question had more to do with their Christ up against my Christ. Who is Jesus and who he is to me is more important than he is to these billboard writers. But I couldn't shake it and without noticing it, time had gone on so fast that it was three minutes left to the destination. My heart was racing, my mouth was dry as if I had to resolve this question or find an answer by the end of the trip. And all of a sudden, I put the car in park. And I said to myself, either he is or he ain't, Tim. Jesus is Christ, right? In today's episode of What's Happening with Jesus, Jesus and his disciples are on a journey to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And while there, I think Jesus might have saw some billboards himself, maybe those for the rising Roman Empire, boards of how inflation has happened with this ruler that didn't happen with the last ruler, or maybe simple slogans of the emperor, our Messiah. And it, these billboards got Jesus to wonder, what do people say about me? Who do people say that I am? Who do my own people that follow me and put their trust in me, who do they think 
when they walk beside me and listen to me as I give wisdom. It's quite clear as he presents this question, he doesn't get the answers he's expecting or wants from his audience. The disciples fail to understand him fully at first, but I imagine the disciples are also tired from this journey. They are more focused on the people that they are supposed to be witnessing and helping and working with rather than Jesus' ego. There could be all sorts of names that he could be called in a short time of his ministry. Maybe a burden bearer or a bridge over troubled water, joy in my sorrow, mother to the motherless, a friend to the friendless. The story can go on and on, bread to the hungry. They could have shared so many different things of who Jesus is, but instead the disciples identify him with other powerful and political men. Then Jesus turns the questions not from what they say, but who do you, who do you say that I am? And Peter steps up, raising his hand. He, he finally thinks he has an answer to a question. He usually gets it wrong, but maybe this time he'll get it right. <laughs> and he yells out, you are the Messiah. The term Messiah is an anglicized form of Hebrew term. It's the Greek equivalent of Christ. Peter's confession is consistent with the narrator's point of view in the first verse of Mark's gospel. The beginning of the good news about the Messiah, Jesus Christ, Son of God. Literally, Messiah or Christ means anointed. To be anointed signifies commission to serve God as an agent of God's purpose. Emerson Powery puts it this way, for Peter and most Jews, Messiah or Christos refers to a militaristic political figure who would overthrow Rome's power and establish a new Davidic kingdom which itself would inaugurate the kingdom of God. And such a divinely a figure could not be one who would suffer many things and be killed. And after Peter speaks, Jesus turns his identity to say, Son of Man, the human one. And as he begins to teach the disciples about his impending suffering, rejection, death, and resurrection, Jesus says all these things boldly. And this is where things get a little bit awkward. Because most of the chapters in Mark, Jesus is telling this messianic secret of don't tell anyone who I am. Be quiet, be quiet. And now he's going around boldly proclaiming who he is out in this public space. And Jesus and Peter tell each other literally to shut up. Peter's views on what a Messiah was, was one who doesn't suffer. They proclaim a new day and a new empire. They relieve the distress through battle and punish those who have caused pain and suffering to an oppressed people. Jesus, you got it all wrong. Death, suffering, resurrection, what is all of this stuff? Either you are or you ain't the Messiah, but you're not supposed to suffer. And that's when Jesus calls the crowd with the disciples and began to proclaim, no longer keeping quiet of his mission, but expanding the mission onto the rest of them. Let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will save it. What profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit your own life? Here's the thing, by learning about Jesus, the disciples learn something about another person, themselves, their own identity too. 
More than three decades ago, the Queen of England came to the U.S. for a 12-day tour. She went to Virginia, Texas, Maryland, going to an Orioles game, and as well as the White House. She also visited a new affordable housing complex known as Drake Place on Southeast. A hundred DC school children were on hand to greet the queen. Trash was picked up, lines were mowed and beautifully done. And the queen was to go and see these new housing complexes and meet a couple of people who were new to their homes. She was accompanied by Barbara Bush as well as Jack Kemp, Secretary of Housing. And this is where Alice Frazier enters the story. Because of who the queen was, there were standard protocol when meeting Queen Elizabeth II. You were only to touch her if her hand was extended out to you. And under no circumstances were you allowed to hug the queen. But on this warm spring day of 1991, D.C. resident Alice Fraser threw all the norms out the window and embraced the then monarch as she walked into Fraser's house in Ward 7. Alice was so innocent and proud of her new home, and of course everyone had told of, a, told of her that the queen could not eat in public unless it was state dinners or something like that. But Alice had made fried chicken, potato salad, deviled eggs, sweet tea. She was ready for this experience, this time with the queen. And though knowing the protocol, as soon as the queen stepped foot into the door, she embraced her with a big hug. Everyone in the background was waving, no, Alice, no. And the queen turned pale. When asked by the Washington Post why she had done such a thing, she said, I would do it to anybody who walked into my house. After all, we are both mothers, and as I learned about her, I learned of our similarities in one another, to treat her just in the same. Of course, after she embraces her, she says, all right, here's your plate, let's eat. They again said, Alice, remember the protocol, she cannot eat in public. But she said, it's who I am. It's my identity to be who I am and welcome all in the same way. Jesus' question of who do you say I am is also asking us to revisit who are we. Can we adequately share our own identity? Identity is often centered around the intersections of every bit of us, whether it's race and gender, sexuality, class, religion. Identity is multifaceted and cannot be understood in isolation from other aspects of a person's life. All these things are interconnected and influence each other in shaping an individual's experience and worldview. Embracing one's full identity, including the aspects that are marginalized or stigmatized. The belief that acknowledging and celebrating all parts of oneself is crucial to understanding personal empowerment and how one acts in the midst of social change. There's a Hindu thought describing the human self as a layered being. We have bodies and minds and then the realm of individual subconscious. And this subconsciousness makes up for so much of who we are as a person. And as we become more conscious of our own experience, we, are, we begin to shape our minds and push toward more of the good and the good and the good and the good. And that then becomes habit within our lives. The identity in Christ is shaping of the mind, the ethics and posture of being, and finds ourselves in this rotation of living together and community. Identity is fluid and complex. There's a famous line that 
which me will survive, which reflects on how different aspects of identity can either thrive or struggle. And according to Jesus, if we do this right, the intersection of following him won't be survival in terms that we have come to understand, but comes with denial, cross-bearing, life-losing, life-saving. So as we understand Jesus asking the questions, who am I, we must ask ourselves, who am I? Who are you? What's your identity? This would be one of those times if we were a church that took notes, that we would take notes and write them down and say, who am I? Who do I strive to be? And now that we have a clearer understanding of who Jesus is and said to be, how do our lives and our identity play a role in this Christian life? Yes, Jesus is hoping our lives will align with his and his mission, but are you secure in your identity and all the facets that make you, you, that you're willing to lay it all on the line? Here's the thing, y'all, either you is or you ain't. Amen.